You are ready to give God some glory this morning. Woke us up this morning. Brought me on my way. When we come out here on Sunday morning, it's always a little bit unpredictable. But I praise God for having the, giving us the opportunity just to be here so that we might enjoy the midst of his spirit as one collective body, one who is in the body of Christ. And I'm gonna tell you something that the devil always tries to get in the way for us to be right here. He might stop you at some point in time too, but I praise God this morning that he was able to get us up, bring us here and give us a nice and sunshiny day. You see, the forecast has said that we were going to have a cloudy day. The forecast has said last week that it was going to be rainy. The forecast has said last week that wasn't exactly sure what was gonna happen, but we left it up to God and God said it was so. And so we just thank God for bringing us here this morning. I don't know about you, but I'm just a little bit filled with the Holy Spirit because God brought me through something this week. And he said, and I told you that I would show you the way. And I told you, I instructed you that if you just believe and if you just receive, that he will make a way and that everything is going to be all right. Won't you join with me in a word of prayer? Most gracious and heavenly Father, we just come before you right now just thanking you for this time that we have together. We thank you, Father, because you brought us this far, not by our own attitude, by our own fruitions, but you brought us here because of the faith that you built up in each one of us. You let us know, Father, that when we were down, you were there, there to bring us out. You let us know when we had some questions that you always had the right answer. And so right now, Father, we come with our hearts and our minds ready to be pricked by your spirit, ready for our hearts and our minds to be caressed by your spirit, your power. And so, Father, we just ask that as we are here as your people, the people of God, those who are sitting here in this parking lot, those who are in our virtual church, those who are in the midst and hear the, the words of God that have been bellowed out by these individuals here today. We just thank you, Father, and just ask that you allow our hearts and minds to be further open so that we might receive your grace, your mercy. And in doing so, I ask that you move me out of this so that your word can be magnified. So that the words that you put upon the heart here of your, your servant may be magnified into the heart of someone else the way they need to receive it. For Father, we thank you. And in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, let us all say, Amen. Here we are on October the 11th. I believe it's probably a little bit over 65 degrees outside. It's at a point that I, I also believe that my sweater that I have on and my winter pants are a little bit too much. So I praise God for that. But I also want to acknowledge that there's some, been some other things that have taken place in these seven months. You see, we have been in a pandemic that has quite created quite a few and produced quite a few tests for the average human being. But I'm a believer that this pandemic has also produced some personal stories. This time in our history has afforded us as the people of God to reflect upon the fears that we embrace, the upsets that took place before because of loss of time and because of loss of opportunity. This time has also reminded us of the things that we have taken for granted. And hence, it has given many of us an opportunity to look back on some of our own, what we probably call some reckless thinking, in the sense of pettiness, I would say, 
and even to some irrelevant issues as just simple things that have no weight in comparison to the loss of life and the loss of human interaction that we have taken so for granted. So from my own observations, here are some things that the pandemic has allowed me to see through my own personal lenses. This pandemic has created long lines at grocery stores, clothing stores, and other retail stores that we freely just went into and purchased an item without any problems. You see, this pandemic has created a retrospective look at how we handle even our own mail and the U.S. Postal Service. This pandemic has created a new appreciation for online purchases from anything from your regular lotion to this going out and getting a little bit of Chick-fil-A or Chipotle. This pandemic has even created a new item that's been added to your daily wardrobe, the mask. And that has created the wanting of some of some of us as fashionable people to coordinate masks with their outfit on a daily basis. But this pandemic has also caused me to look at relationships with my family members in a different way. It has taught me that I need to cherish those relationships because those are the relationships that God has put into my life. For this pandemic and this season in our own lives and in our own and on our own walk has revealed that the grace of God through human daily suffering has been one that we have learned from. This morning, the primary text of this message will be taken from Romans chapter five, verses one through five. Today, I'm just, I wanna go to the Living Bible for this, for this interpretation. And it reads, so now since we have been made right in God's sight, by faith in his promises, we can have real peace with him because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. For because of our faith, he has brought us into this place of highest privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully, joyfully look forward to actually becoming all that God has in mind for us to be. We can rejoice too for when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they are good for us. They help us to be patient. And patience develops strength of character in us and helps us trust God more each time. We use it until finally our hope and our faith are strong and steady. Then when that happens, we are able to hold our heads high no matter what happens and know that all is well. For we know how God, how dearly God loves us, and we feel his warm love everywhere within us because God has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. Verse four, and patience develops strength of character in us that helps us trust God more each time we use it until our hope and faith are strong and steady. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. You see, this Sunday we continue with the sermonic series of God's bandwidth of love, using Rick Warren's study titled The 40 Days of Love as our resource. So this morning I want to take some time to preach on the subject of love is patient. How many of you consider yourself to be a pretty impatient person? <laughs> we think because we as Americans deserve to have the best and we deserve to have it when we want it and we want it right now. We have come across so many commercials and advertisements, advertisements that we see that tell us how much we deserve something and how we need to reward ourselves and instantly do so. We always want something quick. We want it easy. We don't want to have to wait. And we don't care as sometimes how much it's going to cost. If we have to wait in line, we get angry. If there's a shipment that's coming and it's a day late, we want to throw a fit. If the store is out of a product, we just want to show out. And if the restaurant runs out of an item, we are ready to go to Facebook, Instagram, and any other form of social media to tell on them and say that they're not, no, they're not any good and you shouldn't eat there. You see, our society has created monsters of impatience. We want everything and we want it right now and we want it our way. 
So let me just start with let me show you what I mean for a minute. We can start with food, with McDonald's, Taco Bell, Burger King, even the ramen noodles come in such a way now that it takes less time for us to deal with it. But things are built on the premise that we live in a inpatient, inpatient society, so much so that it trickles down to the very things that are the most close to us, relationships. You see, our relationships will become unrealistic. We will place expectations on another person that are not fair and they can't possibly live up to that. We will then expect them to do all the things for us because of a give and take relationship and we get impatient when it doesn't happen that way. We will lose patience with our own kids. We will have, uh, have all of these toys and things that they want to play with and we don't want to spend the time to talk to our kids and to also be patient with our children. We even get impatient at church. Let me say that again. We even get impatient at church. Let me say that one more time. We get impatient at church because we have this high expectation of what it should be because we want the service not to last but one hour period. If service goes a little bit late, we start getting a little squirmy. We start checking on our watches. We start thinking about what's for lunch, what I put on for dinner. Our mindset itself has been scattered because we don't want to come to church for the sake of having a relationship. We want to come for the sake of having an obligation. We don't want to put the time in it. We want to get in, get out, and get on with our lives. But isn't that what impatience does to us? So in the words of one in the one person I've heard over and over again, one comedian, he says, so let's start with a little Bible study. If we're looking at this passage in Romans 5, chapter 1 through 5, I just want to take the teaching moment to look at, very, look at it from the message interpretation. For it tells us just simply this. When it talks about this passage, it says, by entering through faith into what God has always wanted us to do, set us right with him, make us fit with him. We have it all together with God because of our master Jesus. And that's not all. We throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that he has already thrown open his door to us. We find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might, out in the wide open spaces of God's graces and glory, standing tall and shouting our praise but there's more to come. We continue to shout our praise even when we're hinned up in our problems because we know how problems can develop passionate patience in us and how that patience is turned in turn forges the tempered steel of virtue, keeping us alert for whatever God will do next. In alert expectancy such as this, we never left feeling shortchanged. For quite the contrary, we can't round up air enough containers to hold everything that God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. You see, let me say this to you, that these verses are one thing, if you go back and you actually read all of the book of Romans, you will find that these verses actually introduce a section that contains some very difficult concepts for us to even think about. Why? It, because it deals with some things that we deal with on a daily basis that we say either that we don't want to deal with or something that we're going to get back to. To understand these chapters, it helps us to keep in mind the dual reality that we have as we live as Christians in this life. On one hand, we are complete in Jesus Christ. But on the other hand, we are still growing in Christ because we are growing to become more and more like him. We both feel the presence of Christ, but we also feel the temptations of this life that want to make us feel good. We enjoy the peace that comes from being right with God, but we still face daily problems that often help us grow. But if we remember the two sides of the Christian life, we will not grow discouraged as we face temptations and problems. Instead, we will learn to depend on the power that has been afforded to us through the Holy Spirit who lives in us and God's gift for those who believe. We find in these verses when it says, by entering through faith into what God has always wanted us to do, set us right with him, make us fit with him. We have it all together with God because of our master Jesus. We are now at peace with God. 
which may differ from some peaceful feelings such as calmness and tranquility. You see, having peace with God means that we are in a state of reconciliation through our relationship with Jesus Christ. Having peace with God knows that you have been forgiven. Having peace with God is one that we know that has been stored up and we recognize it because we have this constant relationship that we must be working on with Jesus Christ and with God. No more hostility stands between us. And we find that day to day, as long as we are in the sake of asking for God's forgiveness, we will have a relationship with him. Peace with God is possible because we know that Jesus Christ paid the price for our sins through his death on the cross. And even in these great tragedies, we can still find God's peace because it, it gives us the hope, the confident hope in his promises. Paul states here that now that we stand in peace, not only have we declared, has he declared us not guilty, he has drawn us closer to him. But we find something else here. We find in particular where the first Corinthians uh, passage that talks about love gives us another reassurance here is that faith, hope, and love are at the heart of the Christian life. You see, this book that we, that I keep referencing is the one that we did during our Wednesday night Bible study during the summer. And it is the one that gave us a little bit more, a little bit more girth and a little bit more grit to understanding the heart of Christian life. You see, our relationship with God begins with a faith in God. And it helps us to realize that when, when all of those things in which we have gone through have been the very things that God has been present in and have built up our faith. Hope grows us as we learn all that God has in store for us or, or the promises for the future. And then the love, the love that matters that we learned about last week is the one that fills our life and gives us the ability not only to reach out, but to reach out and love on other people. You see, when we go further along in this passage, we see where Paul then because starts to explain a little bit about this future that we will become. And it is a future that we will become in that meaning that we're going to experience some difficulties as we grow. We should rejoice in suffering. You say, Pastor Vicki, what you talking about? We should rejoice in suffering. We should rejoice in suffering because we know and realize that when God gives us some circumstances in our lives that we have to grow through, that means that we are growing closer in who he is and in our relationship with him. It's not that we should rejoice in this suffering because we like the pain or we are, are denying it, but because God is using these circumstances and these situations in our life to build up our character and to build up our witness. But can I tell you something? There's somebody out there, because I run into them every day, who doesn't want to be grown. They don't want the suffering because they don't want to go through it. The problems that we encounter, though, are the very things that develop us into the individuals and the believers that God would have us to do. The problems that we encounter are going to develop our patience and in turn build up our perseverance, which in turn serves as a catalyst that strengthens who we are, strengthens our trust in God and strengthens the confidence that we have in this future. You see, I can't get mad about what's been happening for seven years because as long as we love God and we lean on God, we know and put our confidence in what our future is going to look like. You see, all of what has taken place over the seven, last seven months is just a part of the history of us understanding and gaining just a little bit more girth in who God is. For this passage helps us to understand our faith and an attitude that is necessary in order to be carriers of God's love. It's an attitude that comes from trials. It comes from difficulties. It comes from circumstances. It comes from tribulation. For this passage helps us to acknowledge how we cooperate with God. That's a new one. How do I cooperate? How we cooperate with God. You see, I like it how Rick Warren puts it in the study of love. 
the study of love in 40 days when he says that in order for us to begin to have an attitude that cooperates with God and the circumstances that he puts in our lives, we must acknowledge this part. He says in order to have an attitude that cooperates with God, we got to realize that he puts the circumstances in our lives. His part is to provide the trial, the situation, and the circumstance. What is our part? Is to provide the response. And our, our response comes from the narrative that we live out in suffering. So some of you may look at this and say, look, I don't need no problems in order to gain some patience. I don't need trials in order to gain patience. I don't need difficulties in order to gain patience. But you see, the purpose of problems is not that we need to be troubled, but rather it is God's opportunity to tell us that we need to grow. And in that growing, we will understand God's grace of patience. If you look back on one of your most difficult situations, you probably say, said at that point in time that you did not need to grow. And so God put something in your life at that moment in time so that he said, I need you to grow. So he gives you that opportunity. See, patience is not just about the knack of waiting your turn. So if we take a few minutes just to look at what this definition is. Patience is the ability to restrain one's anger, retaliation, and, and revenge in the face of being provoked. But if we listen to some other definitions beyond what is being said in Webster's Dictionary, patience is self-restraint, which does not hastily retaliate against a wrong. That goes into another connotation. It's the ability to accept disappointment. It's the powerful attribute that enables anyone to stand steadfast in whatever difficulty or situation or even strain. But patience is a calm, what they say, endurance based on a certain knowledge that God is in control. That's patience, is recognizing that God is in control. So let's be honest, sometimes we struggle with patience. We would have to admit that some people irritate you. We would have to admit that there are some circumstances that frustrate you. See, patience is the ability to put up with people you'd like to put down. It's, a, it's accepting a difficult situation without God, without giving God a deadline to remove it. Some of us are like that. You like to give God deadlines. But it's about an inner calmness that comes from the knowledge that God is in control it's the ability to bear trials without all the grumbling that's taking place. And then it tells us that as we do so, it's going to fix my actions. It's going to fix my words. You see, as we study this text as well, and the, through this Bible study, we will find out that here's one thing we know. There's three things that help us on a regular basis to respond to patients. These are the same things that we find in problems that give us a cause and a pause to grow in faith. The first thing is we discovered a bigger perspective. When we go through that, we discover a bigger perspective. For when we are justified by faith, meaning that when we look at all of our situations that have taken place, and then our actions are then a development of what we found in that struggle, that justification by faith is no longer about leaning on your own understanding but rather it's about leaning on the experiences that God has revealed to us that builds up our faith, that builds up a reliance on him to solve our problems and be within the midst of our circumstances. A bigger perspective is gained by the wisdom that we gather through our own trials and tribulations. I don't know about you, but there have been some trials and some tribulations that I had to learn and some lessons that I, God has given me that I, on the other side, I have mastered. For you educators out there, you know what I'm talking about, that I have had to learn how to master. But patience requires us also to go through a process that leads us to maturity. And Isaiah 40, 13 tells us, but they that wait on the Lord will find new strength. 
They will fly high on wings like eagles, and they will run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not faint. You see, patience requires us to go through a process that means that it comes from evidence that God is in control. But God allows trials so that we can stand firm. And patience and maturity helps us to be who God wants us to be. For in James 1, 2 through 4, he said, consider it pure joy that whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance and perseverance must finish its work so that you will become mature. So once you realize how incredibly patient God has been with you, you don't forget where God has brought you through. That you are able with God's help to look at others with the eyes of Christ and not with your own self. And then the second thing is, we deepen our love in who he is. When you go through a trial and a tribulation, when you go through that suffering and you gain that patience, you deepen your love. And then that hence gives you that peace in God. For Warren makes this point that when you feel love, almost nothing will irritate you. But when you feel, when you are filled up with anger and fear, almost anything can irritate you. The comments that people make about you, they irritate you. The situation that keeps on going with no end in mind, that irritates you. The relationship that you have prayed over irritates you. But when you enter this, the, the, the situation with the realization that love matters, irritation lessens. But we recognize that God is a builder of our own patience. And then the last one is, we don't depend on our own power but we depend on the power of Jesus Christ through the relationship that we have with Jesus. Maturity helps us to keep our eyes on Jesus. We can't see, you can't accept the fact that it's just a, in a 40 days, I'm gonna be perfect and I'm gonna be patient, but he will help us to be, be mature and keep our eyes on him. There's somebody out here today that's been dealing with a circumstance and a situation for at least one month. There's somebody that's been dealing with one for at least six months. There's somebody that's been dealing with a situation for at least one year. There's been somebody that's dealing with one for five years. There's been somebody out here that's dealing with one for at least 10 years. And there's somebody out here that's dealing with one since for about 20 years. And then there's some where you stop counting because you're still dealing with the circumstance. But I bet you one thing, if you put God in control of that, he's going to help you go all the way through it at each time and in each matter. Whether it's one day, whether it's one month, whether it's six months, whether it's one year, whether it's five years, whether it's 10 years, whether it's 20 or whether it's the silver or the gold, God is always going to be with you as long as you are patient. We are talking about the fruit of the spirit, a Christ-like character. We're not focusing on ourselves, but we are focusing on Jesus Christ. Too many of us live in what you want to call a microwave situation. You ready for a 10-minute oil change? You ready for fast food? But we can't approach God with that kind of mentality. You can't ask God to fix it now because he's not about all that. For each trial, each circumstance, each one that's going to make you feel just a little bit uncomfortable. For God is teaching us maturity. He's teaching us patience. He desires the final result to be that we look to him first and not to ourselves. For the end result should always be that we are focused on him. He teaches us that we have been seriously wronged and we have to stop and think about the right way to respond. So as I get ready to take my seat, there's a story about two frogs and that these two frogs were around a tub of cream. One looked at the high sides of the tub, which were too difficult to crawl over, and he said, it is hopeless. So he resigned himself to death, relaxed, and sank to the bottom. The other one determined to keep swimming as long as he could. Something might happen, he said. So he keeps kicking, 
he keeps churning. And finally, he finds himself on a solid platform of butter. And then he just jumps to safety. You see, this illustration gives us a very direct example of what it means to persevere. But if I had to look just a little bit deeper, I will find that there's something else that's really uh, prevalent here and gives us a lesson for the day. It's the grace of patience. You see, the epitome of suffering wrapped up with the present day in our face of trials and tribulation helps us to build up and grow into what it means to embrace Christian patience. You see, with the attitude of patience, we are able to gain a better insight around the world and of what the world takes us through. With the attitude of patience, we are able to recognize the rights and the wrongs, the just and the unjust. And with the attitude of patience, we are able to recognize the noise that comes from around us and tries to distract, distract us from really seeing what's going on or where our focus and our attention should be. But with the attitude of patience, we will be able to see through the lens of God, through the vision of Jesus Christ, how we struggle in this world so that we may live out God's purpose. And with the attitude of patience, I will, will be able to on every day and in every way, whether it's today, whether it's tomorrow, whether it's six months from now, whether it's one year from now, whether it's 10 years from now, that I'm going to be able to face the trials and the tribulations and understand that there's a sequential order for this circumstance that allows me the opportunity to rise to the occasion and to push forward and to see the relevance of what one author says is the ABCs of trial. So although things are not perfect because of trial and pain, continue on in thanksgiving. Do not begin to blame. For even when the trials are hard, fierce winds are bound to blow. God is forever able. Hold on to what you know. Imagine life without his love, for joy would cease to be. Keep thanking God for all things above. Love and parts to thee. Move out of my camp complaining. No weapon that is known on earth can yield the power praise can do alone. Quit looking at the future and redeem the time at hand. Start every day with worship. To thank is it a command. And until we see him coming, victorious in the sky, We'll run the race with gratitude, exalting God most high. Say yes, say yes, and say yes, there will be good times. And say yes, say yes, there's going to be some bad times. But Zion waits in glory, Zion waits in glory, where none are ever sad, where no one is ever sad, but we all will be able to benefit from that gladness. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, we just thank you once again for this time that we had in order so that you will explain to us even more so that love matters. It's the love of God that matters. It's the love of God that brings us through and puts us through tests and trials and tribulations so that we will grow in greater in who he is and who you are. So, Father, we just come before you right now. If there's anyone amongst us who's in need of your guiding touch, we ask, Father, that you continue to wrap your arms around them. Is there someone this morning, Father, who is, is feeling lost or in, in need of being found, needs to hear a word from you, who needs to be pricked by you? We intercede on their behalf, for they may not have the words in which to say, and so, Father, we just ask that you continue to be in our hearts and in our minds, that you continue to coddle us even when the world is causing us to fight against you. For, Father, we know that patience endures. Patience endures. But when we do so, we recognize that when we are patient, it's because it's the grace that you have given us, that you have told us as long as we keep our eyes set on you, that we recognize that patience is knowing that God is in control. Gives us the faith. Gives us the hope. And helps us to recognize the love. So, Father, we just thank you. Once again, in your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> We ask if there's anyone amongst us this morning who is in need of prayer. 
I will say again today, if you are in need of prayer this morning, if you are here in the parking lot, if you are in need of prayer, I'm going to ask that if you will come and you can stand right outside your car. We will come and, and pray with you. And then also there's someone here who is who's feeling called to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. We invite you to come and stand and let us know. But if there's somebody here also who is a desire to join this body of believers, we invite you to stand outside your car as well. But for those who are in our virtual setting, we invite you to send us a message at this moment in time. We will get it. And we will be in, 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 in contact with you to pray with you, because it has happened, to pray with you and, and to help you as you foster your way and, and gain and grow in your relationship with God and with Jesus Christ. Won't you come? Hi, my name is Vicki pruitt Sorrell, and I'm the pastor here at Lehigh Community Church. And I want to thank you for viewing our worship service. Here at Lehigh Community Church, we are a community of believers called to carry the message of God's peace throughout the world and in our community. All people are invited to join us on Sundays at 11 o'clock for our spirit-filled worship service. If you're unable to make it to church on Sunday, please consider liking, sharing, or subscribing to our channel. And don't forget to ring the notification bell.